Bienvenue to our Zoom series of lectures about the Grand Chateau from the Loire and Ile-de-France. My name is Jennifer Herline, and I am the Executive Director of French Heritage Society. I would like to say a special hello to our members who have joined us today. French Heritage Society has offices in New York and Paris and 10 chapters across the United States, including one in Chicago. We work together to ensure a future for architectural treasures like the chateaus you're seeing in this series by supporting restoration grants and offering internship opportunities to French and American university students. It is truly my pleasure to welcome you to the Chateau du Louvre today in the company of our special guest, Guillaume Fonquenel, and the series curator, Russell Kelly. But before we get started, a few tips for those of you who are either new to Zoom or who welcome a refresher. You have been muted on arrival and will remain muted to avoid interference during the talk. We encourage you to communicate with us at any time using the chat line. To find the chat line, you can go to the bottom of your screen. It's right there in the middle. Through that little icon, you can tap and right now give it a try and let us know where you're listening from. We also encourage to any, you to ask any questions that might come up during Guillaume's talk using the chat line, and then they'll be answered by him at the end of the program. Please know that you can also mute your video as well if you wish to. I would also like to remind you that there is still time to brush up on your French before we get to travel to France again. The Alliance Française Network offers the best language instruction out there. And what better way to get ready for your visits to the chateaus in France? This series would not have been possible without lead partners, the Alliance Française de Chicago and the Alliance Française Miami Metro. Communication support is provided by the Federation of Alliance Françaises, Weiss, Paris, and French Heritage Society. And now a few words about Russell. A board member of the Alliance Française Miami Metro, Russell Kelly is the curator and moderator of this lecture series on the Grand Chateau of the Loire and Ile de France. He is author of The Making of Paris, the story of how Paris evolved from a fishing village into the world's most beautiful city, which is now available on the Alliance Française de Miami website. He has lived in France for nearly 30 years and has visited every chateau featured in this series many times since his visit to the Loire Valley 50 years ago. And now, Avu Russell. Thank you, Jennifer. And I'm delighted to welcome Guillaume Fonquenel back to the Chateau series. Many of you will have already seen him uh, give his excellent lecture three weeks ago about the Chateau des Couants, the magnificent Renaissance chateau built by the Grand Connétable, the great constable Anne de Montmorency where uh, Guillaume has been the chief heritage curator since 2014. And we're absolutely thrilled that he's uh, here to talk to us about surely the grand grandest of the chateau, the Chateau du Louvre, perhaps better known now as the Palais du Louvre. And Guillaume is uniquely qualified to give the lecture on the Louvre. Yes, you are, because you have written not one, but three books about the Louvre. Uh, he wrote the Palais des Tuileries uh, in 2010, certainly an important part of what used to be the Louvre. He's co-author of the three volume and probably three kilo His Histoire du Louvre, which was published in 2016 and is without a doubt the definitive history of both the Chateau and the Museum of the Louvre. And he is author of the richly illustrated book, The Building of the Louvre, which was published in English in 2017. And as Guillaume will tell us, the Louvre spans 800 years of French history and was enlarged, decorated, modified by generations of French kings and emperors and their architects. But first, Guillaume Fonquenel invites us to watch a short film to introduce the magnificent Chateau du Louvre.
was perfect. Uh, Avu Guillaume, I think we don't need to see the very end. Thank you very much. Uh, so I am very pleased to be with you again this evening because this is the evening for me <laughs> um, in France to speak about uh, so the, the history of the Louvre. I must say that uh, I would like to have written the, the, the definite history of the Louvre, but this is not true because the subject is so big, so complicated. There are so many documents that in fact, it is a never finished uh, story. And since uh, we wrote the great uh, red book in three volumes and three kilos, <laughs> uh, so four years ago, we have already made some new discoveries. So this is a very fascinating subject. You will see the Louvre, uh, and uh, I think you will understand it better with uh, the, the PowerPoint. So let's have a look at some images. Um, now so uh, just one minute to have the full page screen here we are is it correct for you do you see the powerpoint yes perfect, perfect. so um the Louvre uh, is really an exceptional building in France, but also uh, in Europe more generally. Uh, I think uh, it is one of the biggest palace in the heart of a city and of a capital. Uh, this is not a unique case because, uh, for example, so here on the left, uh, you, you can see the Louvre, but there are other very big palaces in the center of cities, for example, the Vatican. In Rome, you can see uh, on the upper right uh, picture. And there is also, for example, the Hermitage uh, in Russia. But uh, the Louvre is also a bit different from uh, those uh, palaces in the heart of the city, uh, because uh, the other palaces were more or less conceived during mainly one period. For example, you can associate the Vatican with the Renaissance period. And you can um, associate the Hermitage with the 18th century. You will see that the history of the Louvre is uh, more complicated because uh, the, the first construction uh, was made so eight centuries ago, but uh, the evolution um, and the evolutions because there are many evolutions uh, during the, the, the eight centuries of history of the Louvre, uh, produced uh, a new building. And we have this, the, the feeling maybe that the history, of course, the, the, the study of the history of the Louvre is never finished, as I told you before, but also the building itself is not really finished. There are always some new transformations inside. The second difference between the Louvre and the other palaces uh, I, I, I told you about um, is the dimensions. Undoubtedly, the, the, the Louvre is uh, the biggest palace uh, in the heart of, of a great city. Uh, and it is twice, it is twice bigger than uh, the, the Vatican, for example. Uh, here we have uh, 208 uh, yes, I, I hope you see the, the mouse on the PowerPoint. So you, you have uh, uh, 280 meters, and here you have uh, more or less um, uh, um, uh, 400 uh, meters, for example, only for that part of the loop. So you see it is really a very big building. And so the evolutions uh, of the, 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 the building are really very, very important. And in fact, if you want to understand the Louvre, you must think not only about one building, but maybe of four different buildings on the same site during the history. You have here two views of the site of the Louvre at the same scale. So you can see the evolution from a little castle uh, on the left uh, to a very big palace on the right. So there are many metamorphoses uh, on this site, and um, we, we will try to understand chronologically 
how the uh, construction evolved. We must say first that the site of the Louvre is not exceptional at all. Today, we have the feeling when we are in the Louvre that we are in the center of Paris, but we must not forget that originally it was not the case at all. The Louvre was built outside Paris uh, during antiquity and also during the Middle Ages. And so we found some, because of uh, some uh, archeological excavations, we found some clues about the way uh, the site was used before the first building was made uh, on this site. And you see that we have found uh, some potteries, some uh, 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 remains of uh, prehistoric occupations, but nothing was really permanent. And uh, there were only uh, little farms and fields uh, till uh, the, 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 the first construction was made. So the site is not exceptional at all. And uh, originally, maybe the castle was not as important as it became later. Because when it was, when the first construction was made during the 12th century, it was absolutely not a great castle. It was not the residence of the king, but it was a military fortress. And this fortress was conceived uh, in order to um, have some soldiers in order to protect Paris because the king, Philip Augustus, decided to go to crusade. And before leaving um, uh, his city, he wanted to, to have a new fortification built. And so there is a great wall uh, that was made in order to protect all the city. And you can see this wall here. And you see that, of course, there are some weak points on this wall. These weak points especially, especially are near the river, the Seine River, because you have to, of course, uh, uh, end the wall uh, before the, the, the river. And so in order to uh, um, in order to, to um, uh, give more strength to this part of the wall, it was decided to build this little uh, castle. And this little castle was also very important because at that time, the king of France was not as powerful as uh, he is today. Uh, as he was, I think, sorry, before the end of the Ancien Regime, because as you know, uh, there is no king anymore in France. Um, all we know about this very old castle, we know because many excavations were made, especially during the project of the Grand Louvre during the 80s. Uh, I will speak about this project in order to finish my, uh, my communication. And uh, so many uh, archaeological excavations were made. You have some pictures of them here. And you see that during this excavation, we discovered again uh, the, the, the lowest part of this castle. Uh, and today we can still visit uh, so the, 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 the parts that were discovered during the 80s. But in fact, uh, so this is a very impressive, I think, uh, visit. But you must be very conscious that the part you visit today is more or less the underground of the medieval uh, castle. And uh, so you can walk uh, inside uh, the bottom, uh, I mean, on the bottom of, of the moat uh, that was around the castle. So this means that uh, you, you can go today in a part where nobody was going during the Middle Ages. And in fact, a great part of this moat was used as a, a sort of dustbin for the castle. So it was wonderful for uh, archaeological excavations because many discoveries were made about uh, the common the life in the castle because of the objects that were uh, uh, put there. But this is not the, the most important part of the castle uh, you see today. And so this is the reason why it is a bit difficult to uh, know exactly how the first castle of the Louvre looked like, bef looked like sorry, before. And you can see here two different reconstitutions, especially there is a question about uh, the roofs. Uh, and you see that in the first reconstitution here, um, there is this idea that there uh, were no roof uh, in the little towers. 
And on the other one below, there is another idea that maybe there were roofs everywhere. So you see, it is very complicated uh, to know exactly uh, how this first castle uh, was conceived and was made. But there are some points that are quite sure. The first point is so that the castle was not made for the king. In fact, you see this is really a fortress. In the center of this fortress, there is a very big keep here. You can see it here on the restitution also below. Uh, and so all of this was made for soldiers because at that time, uh, the King of France uh, had um, not a complete control over the, the, the kingdom. In fact, you can see on the map on the left that uh, the King of France uh, had a direct control only on the part which is in blue. And all that is in uh, uh, green and yellow um, was under the control of vassals. So there was somebody else and the king uh, had sometimes to negotiate with his vassals uh, in order to um, uh, uh, give orders. Uh, and there was a very important vassal at that time. It was the king of England. And so you can see all the territories he had in red. So you know that there was a very big conflict between France and England during many, many years, and, and it finished with the, the famous 100 years war. Uh, but you understand why there was this conflict. And you can see that the territories of the King of England, uh, who was supposed to be the vassal, but uh, it was not really evident, uh, of the King of France, were very closed to Paris, and that in fact the Louvre was built in front of the Normandy. So this is the reason why the Louvre was built. And for, of course, because he had to protect Paris, it was not in the center of the city, but it was really outside the city at that time. The last point is, the last important point is the, the architecture of this first fortress, because some ideas of this, this first fortress um, were maintained uh, during the, the complete history of the Louvre, even if the fortress was uh, destroyed later. Uh, and the important idea is that uh, this castle was built by the engineers of Philip Augustus, and they had an idea of uh, a, a normalized plan. Uh, you see that the Louvre is more, was more or less a square, and that uh, the, the, keep, the, the, the keep was more or less in the center of the court. So geometry was very important for them. And their plan uh, was, it was possible to use uh, this plan in many different sites. And we know that the Louvre was an example for the building of other castles uh, in the territories under the control of Philip Augustus. And this is a complete contrast with uh, his rival, uh, the King of England. And you can see here another castle of the same time in Normandy. So a castle which was built uh, under the control of the King of England. And you see that this castle has a very uh, irregular shape because he wanted to use uh, the, the different possibilities of the site in order to have a better defense. So there is a strong architectural conception, uh, very organized till the beginning uh, of the Louvre. This is the first point you have, to, you have to keep in mind. So this fortress uh, had, um, change, was changed quite, um, uh, quite quickly after its building. In fact, quite wait, quickly, it's not really true because 200 years uh, later, well, 100 uh, and, and half uh, century later, uh, this fortress was not very useful anymore uh, for two reasons. Because first reason, the King of France took the control of the Normandy. So there was no really uh, any threat anymore coming from that part. Uh, and the second aspect is that Paris uh, went bigger and bigger uh, during this period. So the Louvre was not outside the city anymore, but as you can see in this new restitution, 
the Louvre uh, was inside the city. So it was not very useful in order to protect the city anymore. For this reason, the Louvre was uh, transformed to a residence for the king and especially for the King Charles V. So the king had many residences in the capital. Uh, he had um, uh, the palace of the city, he had the Louvre, he had another castle uh, on the eastern part of Paris, um, which the, the name of which is Vincennes. And so he could move from one uh, castle to the other uh, with a boat uh, on the Seine River. So it was very easy for him to go to the Louvre and he decided to transform completely the, the, the fortress to a residence. And you can see this transformation uh, on the picture on the left. So first aspect of this transformation, uh, he created great windows. He made uh, an extra height in order to have more space inside the uh, castle. Uh, and uh, so the first uh, goal of this transformation is to have more comfort. And he also created many symbolic um, uh, as, uh, um, uh, elements in order to show his power and his, his presence inside the castle. And for example, we know that two big statues of the king and of the queen, of the queen, sorry, were uh, just um, uh, in, in near the end, the main entrance. So when you entered the castle, you were more or less welcomed by the two big statues and maybe uh, there's two stat statues here that are today uh, in, the, in the Louvre collections were the statues that were on the entrance of the Louvre. Uh, there were also other symbolic elements, especially in the staircase, because in the staircase, all the family uh, of the king was uh, represented in sculpture. And there is one last important aspect. Uh, you know maybe that Charles V had um, a nickname, if I may say so, uh, is said to be Charles the Wise. And so he created in the Louvre uh, one of the first very important libraries in France. And in fact, this library was in one uh, uh, tower, uh, in, in one angle of the Louvre. And so the three upper levels were devoted to the library. So uh, there was uh, the first level with uh, important book with uh, miniatures and uh, uh, drawings. And there was uh, in the middle, uh, there was uh, the library for poetry and for novels. And on the upper uh, floor, there were um, books um, um, more especially linked with science. So there were uh, astrology, um, geometry and so on, and books in Latin also. So it was a library directly connected to the apartment of the king. And you see here on the left, a view of the king in uh, his library and on the right, an attempt to uh, restitute uh, the, the aspect of this library. Uh, so it was a library for the king, but it was also a library for important persons. And we know that uh, so some uh, guests were invited to uh, go, go to the library and that they could borrow some book. And there, was, uh, there were more than a thousand books uh, in the library uh, during the time of Charles V. The library was dismantled after his death, but it is considered to be today uh, the origin of the French National Library, so the, the most important collection of books in France. Uh, so here we have a first part of the history of the Louvre. You see a little castle. Uh, it is only uh, 60 meters uh, long. Uh, and uh, this little castle was outside Paris, but was transformed progressively to a residence uh, for uh, the king. And uh, a new project uh, was conceived during the Renaissance. And this project was more or less realized during, realized, sorry, during uh, three uh, different centuries. So the transformation was conceived for, of 
course, the King Francis I, but in fact, he died one year after uh, the, the rebuilding of the Louvre um, uh, was uh, made. And so um, his son, Henry II, you can see on the right, is maybe the king uh, who is the most particularly associated during the Renaissance with uh, the Louvre. So the idea uh, of uh, Francis I and of his son, and the idea also of their architect, uh, Pierre Lescaut, uh, the idea was to rebuild the entire Louvre, but they began only uh, with the west wing uh, of the Louvre, as you can see here. So the old medieval castle was there on the, on the north, on the east and on part of the southern wing, and the west and part of the southern wings were rebuilt. And also, uh, very uh, an another very important decision was made uh, by Francis the uh, First. It is the decision to destroy uh, the keep uh, in order to have a, a, a more comfortable court uh, inside the castle. So this new architecture is, in fact, more or less connected. Uh, with the movement we described in uh, Equan uh, when I spoke about this castle before. Uh, and so you can also uh, have an idea of that if you compare a medieval castle like the Plessis Bourré and the new facade of the Louvre in the court uh, here on the top uh, of the slide. Uh, you see that uh, the windows uh, which were irregular uh, in the French castle are now perfectly regular. So there is a symmetrical organization of the facade. The staircase, which is so important in French architecture, because uh, if you um, uh, remember well, you know that the main um, uh, owner of the castle is supposed to live on the first floor. So it is very important to know where the staircase is. And you see that the staircase is very visible in the medieval castle and the staircase is more or less hidden uh, in the new architecture. In fact, the staircase is here on the right. Uh, and the last aspect is also the transformation of uh, the roof because we don't have any dormer window anymore, but we have this little uh, level here. Um, so uh, the last level of the castle is not as tall as the others and it is called an attic uh, level for this reason. So many transformations uh, between uh, Middle Ages and uh, this new architecture. And the idea is not to have a castle anymore, but the idea is to have a palace. And the idea of palace is of course connected with antiquity, because as you know, uh, the, the, the name palace uh, uh, is derived from uh, Palatium. So this is the name of the palace of the Roman emperors uh, in Rome. And there is a very important decoration uh, on this facade. And this decoration was made by Jean Goujon. We already met also when we speak, um, when we spoke before about uh, Equan. And so Goujon conce conceived this, this very exceptional sculpture, and this sculpture is um, a, a symbolic um, a representation of the power and the importance of the king. And you can see here that there is a victory uh, with a crown. Uh, you can see here that there is the fame, the fame of the king with a trumpet. And here you have allusions to the government uh, of the king and especially of his power on the right, because you see that this allegory uh, has a great drapery and the drapery is falling on the globe. So this is the idea that the power of the king of France uh, will be maybe one day an, a universal power. So there is a sort of symbolic portrait of the king invented here during the Renaissance uh, with this extraordinary sculpture with very low uh, relief. Uh, inside, there, are, uh, there were many important rooms, but they are more or less destroyed today. I will show you uh, only one of them. This is uh, so the, the, the great uh, hall for festivities on the ground floor. 
And this hall is very famous because they are karyatids. As you can see here, a tribune with karyatids when you enter the room. And of course, today for us, the karyatids are connected with uh, Athens and with the Acropolis, because we all know that there are karyatids. Uh, you can see them on the right. Uh, on the Acropolis. But we must remember that during the Renaissance, Athens was under the control of the, <coughs> sorry, of the, the Ottoman Empire. So Christian people were not welcome uh, at all uh, in, uh, the, in Athens. So we've, we are not sure that during the Renaissance, the architects really knew that uh, there was this tribune uh, on the Acropolis. And the idea of the architect of Henry II was maybe different because he knew, everybody knew that there was a copy of this Greek tribune in Rome. And this copy was uh, in a very symbolic place because this copy was uh, on the forum you can see on the left. And uh, uh, this part of the forum was built by the Emperor Augustus. So you see that maybe in the idea of the architect, the principle is to make a reference to the emperor of the uh, Roman Empire in the residence of the King of France, in order to say that the king is the heir of uh, the great uh, emperors uh, of the antiquity. There is another very important element uh, in the history of the Louvre at that time. This is the decision of Cath Catherine de Médicis. Uh, so you know that she was the wife of Henry II and the king uh, died uh, quite soon. And after that, uh, she played a very important political role uh, during the second half of the 16th century and especially during the wars of religion in France. And Catherine so decided to have a palace for herself, not far from the Louvre, uh, maybe uh, 500 meters on the west okay, of the Louvre. It was supposed to be an independent palace originally with a very great garden. And in fact, um, it is maybe a bit surprising for us, but uh, Catherine um, uh, uh, asks for works mainly in the garden. So the palace, you see this very big palace with five different courts was not built, uh, was not finished. I mean, during the, the reign of Catherine and only a little part of it was built. This part here, so only one wing was built and this wing was not finished when Catherine, Catherine died. Uh, so it was not possible to inhabit this part of the building. And we know that when Catherine came to the Tuileries garden, uh, she had a little house uh, here near the Seine River. And so that uh, it was in this little house that she lived when she came to the Tuileries. So a great project for a palace, but a little realization, but a great idea and especially a great garden. And this, uh, so here you have the situation uh, after the death of uh, Catherine de Médicis. So you see that we have the Louvre, uh, so partially rebuilt by uh, Henry II and uh, his sons. You have the beginning of the Tuileries Palace here. You have the Great Garden. Uh, and uh, there are no connections between the two palaces uh, because there is a moat uh, conceived by, by uh, Charles V uh, between the two palaces. And so the uh, king uh, who uh, arrived uh, on, the on the throne uh, at the beginning of the 17th century is Henry IV. And Henry IV was not the son or the grandson of Catherine de Medicis. Uh, he, he was from a very different branch of the family. And he wanted, uh, he, he came, he, he arrived in Paris after uh, the wars of religion. So it was very important for him to say that he was really the successor uh, of the, the, the kings before him, although uh, he was not their, their son or their grandson. And he also wanted to show his power. So he had the idea of what we call 
the grand dessin. This is the great design. And this great design uh, um, is the idea to make a connection between the Louvre and the Tuileries uh, with a great gallery, uh, which uh, will take place here uh, near the Seine River. And the second aspect is uh, to create a great a court here. Because as you know, uh, the Tuileries was a very important palace, at least in project. And so compared to the Tuileries, and especially compared to the Tuileries garden, the Louvre appeared to be a little uh, castle. And for this reason, it was decided to, re to, to complete the little castle in order to have something bigger. So first idea, you see here the, 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 what was made by Henry IV. Uh, the uh, construction of this great gallery. It was a really surprising building because so it is more than 500 meters long. It was a very tall, it was maybe the tallest building in Paris when it was made. And you have an idea of the effect of this building. If you look uh, at the engraving on the top, you see that uh, uh, everybody could see the great gallery uh, from uh, uh, many places in Paris. So it was really very important. And uh, you have uh, on, on the bottom of the slide, you can uh, have a, a view of this gallery today. So first aspect of this Grand Dessin. The other aspect is the great uh, court, uh, which is called the Cour Carré, so the square court. And you see that the idea of the architects of Henry IV was to take the, the wing built during uh, the Renaissance and to copy it in order to double uh, the dimensions uh, of each wing. Uh, so the little castle became a very big uh, palace. Uh, and we must, uh, in order to have a comparison, so the square court was the, the biggest place uh, empty in Paris at that time. And there are other um, construction commissioned by Henry IV, and especially uh, the Place des Vosges, uh, which was um, conceived to be uh, 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 an empty space around the main statue of the king. But the Place des Vosges was more or less as big as the square court. So you see that the dimensions were very surprising at that time for Paris and maybe uh, for Europe more generally. So this very grand dessin, it was very difficult to build because uh, the king, uh, the kings needed a lot of money to, to build this grand dessin. Uh, and so it took a long time in order to achieve uh, this great design. Uh, it took a long time and also some transformations were made in the conception of the Grand Dessin uh, by the kings later. And this is the case, especially uh, with Louis XIV and uh, his uh, uh, most important uh, uh, minister, uh, Colbert. So you can see Colbert on the left and Louis XIV on the right. Uh, first aspect, uh, Louis XIV asked for new decorations inside uh, his apartments, and some of them um, are still there today. This is the case, especially for the great gallery of the king, uh, the gallery of Apollo. And this decoration is very important because it was made before Versailles, so you will see next week that uh, uh, some, some examples of the great decorations uh, for Louis XIV, and I think that you saw maybe uh, some of them before when you studied Volvicomte. So it is an important decoration in the history of French decorations uh, in France. And also it is very important because it is one of the first times where um, uh, uh, Louis XIV was associated with Apollo. Before that, it was asso associated more or less with Herculeus. Uh, more than with Apollo. So today, for us, it is completely clear that uh, Louis XIV is the Sun King, but uh, it was a, a progressive elaboration and the Louvre played an important role uh, in this idea that there is a connection between Louis XIV and Apollo. Uh, an important problem at that time was how to finish the square court. 
And an important problem was especially on the eastern wing here. So today, maybe you don't know really this wing because uh, the, 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 I think the, the, the orientation of the palace was changed later. So today, when you enter the museum, you enter in what we call the Napoleon court, uh, which is here on the left. And uh, many people do not enter anymore in the square court. And this entrance today, uh, this wing appears for us as the rear facade of the Louvre. But we must understand that it was not the case at all when uh, the uh, project was made, because this uh, facade was the, the facade which was uh, um, uh, uh, toward the city. So when you entered the Louvre, you have to go, uh, you, you have to, to come first and see this uh, facade. And so this facade was very important. And for Louis XIV, it was decided to change uh, the, the original design conceived during the Renaissance. So not to copy anymore uh, the Renaissance, but to invent, to create something new. And Louis Levaux, who was the, the first architect of the king, uh, had the, this, the idea of this very original facade, but uh, many contestations were made against him and an international competition was organized. And this is the first time in the history of the Louvre that an international competition uh, was organized in order to um, provide the good project for the Louvre. And so in this competition, many architects uh, were uh, involved. It was the case for great French architects like François Mansart. So you can see uh, on um, uh, here a, a drawing by Mansart, uh, but there were also uh, some Italian architects and especially Bernini. And Bernini was of course a great Baroque sculpture, but he was also an architect and he was the main artist of the Pope. So he sent a project in Paris and then he was invited in Paris uh, to um, work on his project. But after he left, his project was uh, not uh, maintained. And finally, the king decided to have uh, an extraordinary facade, which is known today as the colonnade. So the colonnade, why? Because the colonnade is a portico. And here you see that there is a big portico very strange, in fact, uh, on the facade. Why is this portico very strange? Because, of course, the idea of a portico is connected with a, a temple in, during the antiquity. Uh, but here you see that the portico is not on the ground floor, but, sorry, but on the first floor. Uh, so first important difference. Second important difference, the dimensions. The portico is so big that uh, only one column here was not able to support uh, the, the, the weight of the entablature. So for this reason, the architect had to double each column, uh, which is not, uh, which is very rare during antiquity. And the other aspect is that, so it was technically very difficult uh, to build this portico here on the first floor. And for this reason, uh, they have the, the architects of Louis XIV had to create great scaffoldings. Uh, you can see them uh, on, on the right. And they had also to use a new material, uh, it's iron, because there is iron everywhere. So you see some deta details, sorry, of uh, uh, iron structures inside the building. And this iron is never visible from the outside, but is absolutely essential in order to maintain the whole structure. So two important aspects to have in mind during this period. First, an international competition. Uh, and second, uh, a new technology, but a technology which is hidden. The, ap the appearance is antique and the technology is completely modern. So after the, the death of Louis XIV, you see that uh, the palace evolved a lot. The great palace of the Tuileries was finished. The most important part of the square court was finished, but in fact, uh, it was not completely possible to inhabit every part of it. The Eastern wing and the Northern wing was, were finished. If you look at the wall, 
but not if you look at the roofs and at the windows and so on. And there was no connection here. And so the idea, of course, was to create this connection in order to have a symmetry with uh, the great gallery. So there was another gallery which was proposed here in order to create a complete uh, grand dessin. But after the death of Louis XIV, as you know, uh, the kings lived uh, inhabited um, in, in Versailles. And so they were not interested in Paris anymore. And for this reason, the palace was more or less uh, abandoned, but uh, it was in fact an opportunity for a new project and for Utopia, and especially for one uh, utopic project, uh, the, the, the birth of a museum. And here you have an allegory of the uh, creation of the museum. And so this museum, we must be careful about it. It is a temple for the daughters of Apollo. So it is not only a museum as we, we, we think uh, today. Of course, there, this museum uh, had uh, many goals and one of these goals was to uh, uh, display the collections of the king, paintings and sculptures and so on. And you can see here uh, paintings uh, and, and sculptures uh, under the supervision of, of the king. Uh, which is represented here uh, uh, in the center. Uh, but there were other uh, aspects in this project. Uh, the Louvre uh, had to be a center for uh, the artists and many artists were, uh, had um, uh, some flats in the room, uh, in the Louvre, sorry, and could uh, work and live inside the palace. So there was a very strong connection between the Louvre and what we would could today, what we would call today contemporary art. Uh, and the last aspect is that uh, in the Louvre uh, there should also um, be a, a very important library. So the the, the Royal Library uh, had to be uh, uh, in the Louvre. Uh, and also uh, the Louvre was supposed to be the place for many schools. It was the case because uh, the Academy uh, uh, of Painting and of Sculpture and the Academy of Architecture in France were in the Louvre. And in those academies, there were a part for teaching. And uh, so pupils were there in order to learn uh, how to paint, how to, uh, to, to draw architecture and so on. So you see this museum, it is a very complex project. And for this reason, this project um, was not realized before the French Revolution. But uh, during the French Revolution, the project was not uh, as ambitious as uh, during the monarchy. And here on the right, you have the idea of uh, the museum um, uh, in a dream by, by, by a painter. And here on the left, you have a vision of the real museum. And so you see here on the right, a great architecture with a light coming from the ceiling and with many paintings with marble and so on. But in fact, when the museum uh, was opened for the first time at the beginning of the French Revolution, uh, in fact, only a little part of the first floor of the great gallery uh, was open and uh, only 600, uh, paintings were on display. Uh, today, there are more than 10,000 uh, works of art on display in all the Louvre. So you see that the beginning was quite modest, but very important. Um, the French Revolution had also uh, another major impact uh, on the Louvre because the king, uh, so Louis XVI and uh, his wife, the Queen Marie Antoinette, they had to come back to Paris and they had to live in the Tuileries. So the Tuileries became the palace of the power during, uh, uh, at that time, and uh, it remained the palace of the power during all the 19th century till it was destroyed. I will explain, I will, sorry, explain that later. So it was the palace for the king when there was a king, it was the palace for the emperor when there was an emperor, and it was the palace for the assemblies of the republic when there was a republic. And so you can see here, for example, the first assembly room 
uh, one of the first important assembly rooms uh, uh, of the French Revolution inside the palace of the Tuileries. So at this time, you see that the palace has more or less the size, at least in project, as it has today, but that there are two projects that are uh, uh, in, uh, con in, in front of each other. So there is one project uh, with a museum, a space for culture, and one another project uh, connected with the power. So the space of the power or the space of culture, that is all the question. And this question will be solved during the 19th century. So here you have, um, yes, an idea of the situation at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and so uh, this is the situation when the emperor Napoleon, so Napoleon I was emperor in France. And uh, the uh, Grand Dessin was completed by uh, his uh, nephew, uh, the emperor Napoleon III uh, during the middle of the 19th century. The problem uh, of the architect is to complete uh, the, the Grand Dessin. Uh, and so many projects were made and many architects uh, worked uh, on the Louvre. Uh, there are three uh, very important uh, architects. You can see them here. You have Duban on the left and you have Visconti and Le Fuel who worked more or less together on the right. So Duban, uh, was uh, the architect of the Louvre during a little period, period, sorry, in the center, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, when there was a republic in France. So during four years uh, between uh, the restoration, when there were kings and between the empire, there was a, a little time for a republic, the second republic. And during this time, some um, uh, works were made in the Louvre, and they are very important because for the first time, the Louvre was considered as a historic monument. And this is a very important concept in France. The idea that uh, the monument is not only a living building, but that uh, it could have an in historic interest and that it is important to preserve history or to recreate history. And you have a good example of this with the restoration of the little gallery. So the little gallery was connected, was connecting, sorry, the square court and the great gallery. And in this little gallery, uh, so this little gallery was built a first time by Henry IV. You can see the building of Henry IV uh, on the bottom on the left of the slide. But this gallery was destroyed in a fire during the reign of Louis XIV, and it was rebuilt. So the first floor had to be rebuilt, uh, and it was transformed by Louis Levo, we spoke before. And you see that it did not exactly uh, follow uh, the first project because there were orders of architecture on the, comp on, on the first floor in all uh, around every window. Uh, originally when it was built by Henry IV, and there were uh, orders only in the center after the rebuilding of Levaux. And Dubon, uh, when he made his restoration during the middle of the 19th century, he had the idea that it would be good to go back to the original state, to recreate uh, the historic state that disappeared. And for this reason, he, 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 he created orders everywhere again on the first floor in order to go close to the original project. And he also created this uh, Oculus uh, here uh, in the dormer windows uh, on the, uh, in the roof, uh, which disappeared during Louis XIV. So it is a very important aspect of the notion of historic monuments in France, uh, which appeared here more or less uh, in, in some buildings uh, and especially in the Louvre during this period. So the other aspect of the, the, this period is the idea to uh, uh, finish the, the Grand Dessin, the great design. And it was very, very important for Napoleon III because he was living in the Tuileries. So he was living here and he wanted to have an important court. It was the last very important court in France, the court of the, the, the Second Empire. 
And uh, so uh, for uh, a court, you have to, uh, you, you, you need to have many, uh, many services in order to work for the court. And so first aspect, you have to have, uh, you need to have uh, stables with many horses. So uh, here in uh, the new southern wing uh, of this new court, which is called the Napoleon court, you will see that there, uh, uh, that stables were created. And here in the northern wings, many offices uh, for the administration and great apartments for the prime minister, more or less, of the second empire were created. Uh, this new court, so the Napoleon, the, the Cour Napoleon, uh, is today the most important court in the Louvre because when you enter uh, into the Louvre um, uh, in the pyramid, uh, you have to go through the Cour Napoleon. And so in this court, there is also always, as usual, I may say, in the Louvre, uh, some symbols of the importance of the power. And especially on the two main pavilions, there are portraits of the Emperor Napoleon III and Napoleon I. And uh, here on the first floor, there are uh, 99 statues uh, representing great men in the history of France. This was very important because, of course, there were many conflicts during this period in France about the good regime. And uh, the empire wanted to say that <clears throat> he was the, the, the heir of all the great men before. So, of course, there is this question, uh, it could be a republic, France could be a monarchy, an empire, and so on. But in fact, the empire says it is not really important. What is important is that we are a great nation, uh, whatever uh, our uh, political system is. And so this is a sort of demonstration here in the stone of this idea. So when you go inside in the southern wing here, you have uh, in the underground uh, great stables. So you can see uh, there's stables for horses uh, originally, and you can see uh, them today. You see that they are transformed for uh, the museum and that many works of art are now on display in these stables, but you can still recognize the general architecture, especially with the brick and with the pillars here. And so uh, this is for the underground of this wing. And uh, in the other parts, uh, you have architecture for a new extension of the museum. So you see that it was very important for Napoleon III to have services for the court, but that the museum was also important. And so uh, here, Le Fell created a, a new kind of museography. Uh, so a new kind of displaying works of art. Uh, on the ground floor, uh, for sculpture, you have uh, light coming from the windows and you have uh, a stone everywhere. And on the first floor for the paintings, you have light coming from the ceiling and you have a very rich decoration with gold and so on and so on. The idea is that uh, at that time, in order to present a very important masterpieces, you have to present it in a very beautiful uh, architecture. So we have this idea that there should be a connection with uh, the, the uh, between uh, the works of art inside the museum and the architecture. And especially here uh, uh, in this part of this room, for example, you have the great names of the painters uh, uh, whose works of art are just beneath that are uh, on display. So you see this connection between uh, the architecture and the works of art inside the museum. In the northern wings, uh, you have many uh, so uh, little offices, but you have also a great uh, apartment for the prime minister, uh, which uh, still exists today. And this apartment is very typical of what we call the Napoleon III style, uh, which is eclectic. So for example, for the main reception room, uh, on the right, uh, the architect imitated the great decoration of the Apollo gallery. So the art of Louis XIV for great reception room. But for little rooms, for more intimate spaces, uh, they copied uh, some other models uh, in Versailles connected uh, with Louis XV. 
So we have this idea of using different styles uh, in different spaces. Uh, so the great architecture, the great monarch, and uh, for little spaces, a different reference. It is very typical of Napoleon III, always this idea to look at every period of the history before in order to create a new architecture. So the great design was finished by Napoleon III, but uh, it was not for a long time because when the empire, when the second empire collapsed, there was a civil war in France between Paris and the rest of, this, of the country. And when uh, the government that was in Paris, which is called the Commune, the Paris, uh, was destroyed, uh, uh, they decided uh, to put fire um, in many important monuments in Paris, and especially in the Tuileries. And you see here the Tuileries uh, on fire during uh, the Commune de Paris, and here the ruins uh, of the palace. And in fact, we uh, have been very lucky because uh, the fire uh, did not go uh, to the Louvre itself. And if it would have been the case, we would have lost all the collection. Uh, so uh, it is a very dramatic uh, uh, event, uh, moment in the history uh, of the Louvre and also in the history of Paris and in the history of France. And so after that, it was decided not to rebuild the Tuileries, especially because the Tuileries were connected with uh, the, the memories of the kings and the emperors of the French court and so on. So the palace was destroyed, but not rebuilt. And so the idea of an imperial city uh, completely close uh, compared to the city outside uh, disappeared. And this is a new part of the history uh, of the Louvre, uh, which began at that time, because the power left uh, the Louvre in order to go to the Palais de l'Elysée. Uh, and so the Louvre was more or less free for the museum. And the museum uh, has triumphed, finally. Uh, so um, uh, during the, the a very important episode uh, in this progression of the museum was during the 30s, because during the 30s, uh, a director of the national museums who was also responsible for the Louvre, Henri Verne, uh, decided to change deeply the presentation inside the Louvre. And you have a good example of this evolution with the same space. So this is the main staircase of the victory of Samothras. Uh, so this is this Greek sculpture you can see here. And you see, uh, so the staircase uh, at the end of the 19th century and then in the 30s, you see that the transformation is complete. There were many works of art around the victory of Samothrace, they disappeared. There were many decorations uh, in the upper parts, they were completely covered. And the architecture is very simple. We have here this idea for the first time that there must be no interference between architecture and the works of art, and that the architecture must, must more or less disappear. Uh, we don't have to be disturbed by the architecture. We have to look only at the work of art. So Verne created this new uh, uh, idea of museography. Uh, he also uh, had the idea to um, give new spaces in the museum by covering some courts. Here you have a little court, uh, which is called the Cour du Sphinx. And so you see he here during the, the works made by uh, Henri Verne. So this court was covered by a great ceiling with glass in order to give uh, an important light inside uh, the room. And last uh, other aspect of the, of the politics of uh, Henri Verne, uh, the idea that uh, the Louvre is made for the public. So this is the first time an entrance was really organized for the public with a bookshop, with the opportunity to look for a, a guide in order to have some information for the Louvre. And that you see that some books were created in order to um, uh, give some information to the visitor and especially this little uh, guide by the image. Because at that time, the Louvre, the, the museum began to be very important and it was a bit uh, disturbing maybe for the visitor who could be lost inside the museum. 
So they had this idea to create maps uh, in order to give some information to the visitor. Last aspect, during this period, for the first time, electricity arrived in the Louvre. And so there were two major evolutions. First aspect, the security. And the first checkpoint was created inside the museum. You, you can see the representation uh, of this um, uh, uh, checkpoint on the left. And second aspect, because of electricity, it was possible to organize visits during the night. And it was very important because the public of the museum changed. People who were working during the day now had the opportunity to visit the Louvre during the night. So you see that during the 30s, we can say not only that the museum conquered a significant part of the Louvre, but also that the Louvre became a modern museum. And all this modernity was the good preparation for the last stage of our history, uh, I mean the Grand Louvre. So the Grand Louvre is the project of the president, uh, François Mitterrand, sorry, you can see on the left, and the architect, the, the, the Chinese, but also American architect, because he worked and he lived the most important part of his life um, in the United States, I mean, human pay. And here on the right, uh, I, I show you the first letter uh, written by the Ministry of Culture to the President of the Republic, so from Jack Lang to François Mitterrand. And Jack Lang, for the first time, uh, says, oh, it would be good to transform the Louvre in order to uh, create the biggest museum uh, in the world. It is underlined here in the letter. Uh, and uh, so he said that the last administrations that were in the Louvre had to leave the building and that a great project had to be organized. And François Mitterrand wrote the answer uh, in the, on the upper part on the right of the letter. You see his handwriting and he says, oh, this is a good idea. But as every good idea, it is difficult and that's all. And it began with this only little mention of François Mitterrand. So the most important and the most famous aspect of this new project is the pyramid. You know that it was a very difficult subject and that in France, we speak about the battle of the pyramid because many people were against this uh, pyramid. And this pyramid, in fact, had two main aspects. The first one is that a modern architecture with modern material for the first time should be visible in the Louvre. This is quite an innovation because I remember to you that when the colonnade was made during Louis XIV, iron was completely hidden. And here, iron and glass would be really on display in the center of the new court. Second aspect, uh, the, uh, the pyramid uh, should be a, a very visible entrance, uh, very easy to find and to understand to everybody. But Pei himself said that the pyramid could be something else, for example, a cube, a sphere, everything else, that there was no absolute necessity to have a pyramid. And so many caricatures were made against this project. You can see, for example, here, uh, different ideas, a pyramid, uh, a pyramid, but not in the same uh, orientation and so on. So you can see that the debates were really very important. But in fact, this debate must not uh, hide the importance of the project because the pyramid is not the most, it is the most visible aspect of the project, but it is not the most important because under the pyramid, uh, there is a complete uh, um, uh, network of new circulations. You, you can see here how complex it is around and, and uh, under the, the pyramid. You have many different circulations. You have the bookshop, you have the space to buy your ticket and so on. You have restaurants, you have um, uh, also a room for concerts uh, and so on. So it is a very complex project. And also uh, the Grand Louvre, was um, a project, uh, a project which, which transformed deeply the old palace. You can see, for example, the northern wing here in transformation. So all the roofs were rebuilt. You see that the little rooms where there were offices were destroyed in order to have great space for sculpture, for example. 
So the transformation was really, really important with a new idea of the way of displaying works of art. So Pei worked a lot uh, on the, the, the light with the ideas he, here to have a very regular and very smooth light uh, uh, falling from the ceiling. And we also have always this idea that architecture must more or less disappear uh, in order to let us focus only on uh, pictures and on the works of art inside. Uh, some courts were also uh, transformed uh, and some transformations are very, very important. So it was the case for the courts in the northern wing. So you have here the court before the Grand Louvre and here the court after. So you see that uh, the, the, the rear facade of this court was completely rebuilt, that a new uh, uh, roof was conceived and that many staircases were created inside. And uh, so this idea of using the courts was also uh, at the origin of the last transformation of the Louvre, uh, which happened only 10 years ago, uh, which is the creation of a new Islamic department in one of the courts in the southern wings. And you see also this very original structure. So modern architecture is very present inside the Louvre. And this is the only uh, historic monument in France where you can find very old architecture, but also very innovative and new modern architecture. And in fact, each period has its own identity inside the palace. In order to finish about that, so you see that this uh, story is very complicated. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can, uh, and, and if you want to, to see again some restitutions, you can uh, have a look at, at the book I, I wrote with Hubert Nodex, uh, and you have the cover of it on the left. And you see that this history is very complicated because on the right, uh, I reproduce the plan created by the Wikipedia users, and you see that there are 21 different colors uh, in this plan uh, in order to try to explain how complex this history is. But what is important to have in mind, I think, to finish is that um, uh, the Louvre, of course, this is a museum, of course, this is a palace, but this is also a symbolic monument in France. And uh, so you see that Yuming Pei said that the history of Paris is embedded in the stones of the Louvre. And I would like to correct him a little. In fact, I think that the history of France is embedded in the stones of the Louvre. And you see that uh, when uh, Emmanuel Macron made his first speech as French president, so Mordé, he made his inauguration night, but we don't have any equivalent of what you do in the United States, uh, really. But he decided to make this first speech in front of the pyramid of the Louvre. And this is a real symbol of the importance of the Louvre in French history and for French people more generally. I've been a bit too long, I'm sorry, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Guillaume, uh, for, for that tr tremendous presentation, taking us through 800 years of history. Uh, we've had a lot of questions. Um, let me ask a ha half dozen. Um, where does the name the Louvre come from? Ah, this is a very, <laughs> we don't know exactly. In fact, um, uh, it, it was uh, uh, during a long time, it is said that uh, the name was connected with uh, wolves because wolves, they are loup in France, in, fr in French. So loup, Louvre, uh, there could be a connection. But today uh, we think that there is a different origin and that in fact, it should have been the name of a very little river which was there because uh, the Louvre in Latin, it is said Lupara. And uh, the, the, the Ara part of this name uh, is a Celtic name in France for river, for water. So maybe this is the name of a pond or of a little river that was there a very long time ago and which has completely disappeared today. Okay. Um, when we looked at the, uh, first of all, you, you gave us a totally different view of the Louvre from the one that we got from that drone film. The drone film approached from the West and went into the Cour Napoleon and it stopped 
there. It didn't even show the Kuakai, hmm. much less the Kolonad. But you brought to our attention very clearly and importantly that once upon a time, it was the other way around. You entered from the east and the backyard was behind the, I think there was a kitchen garden, wasn't there? Yes, exactly, in the Cour Napoléon. Where the Cour Napoléon is, which is, which is interesting. One of the questions that comes up, but also when we saw the drone film, which it, it came in, came in, came in on the Arc de Triomphe du Carousel, and then it had to shift a little bit. Yeah. Could you comment on the X historique, the historic axis, and, and the challenge of uh, making it the Louvre design symmetrical? Of course. Um, so this is the very important aspect of the history of the Louvre, but I, I am sorry, I, I had no time here to speak about that. So thank you for the question very much. In fact, uh, the Louvre, uh, and more precisely the Tuileries, uh, are connected with the, the great extension uh, of Paris to the West, because when the Tuileries were transformed by Louis XIV, a very important French gardener uh, uh, was uh, uh, working here. It was André Le Nôtre. And Le Nôtre wanted to create a great view from the palace to uh, the horizon. And so he decided to create a great avenue. Uh, at that time, this avenue was entirely uh, in the fields. So it was very easy to create a new avenue. And so this avenue was created from the end of the garden to the top of the hill. And after that, it stopped. So you see that it was really for the view. It, the, the, the avenue did not go further on the outside of the hill. And this avenue, it was the beginning of the famous Champs-Élysées because it became a major axis for the development of the city towards the west. But this avenue, of course, is uh, in the axis of the Tuileries. And the problem is that, as you, you remember, the Tuileries and the Louvre were not conceived originally to be only one palace. So the Tuileries and the Louvre were not completely parallel. So there is a little angle between today the Champs-Élysées Avenue uh, and the arch of the carousel, uh, which is in front of the pyramid. And so the arch of the carousel was the entrance of the court of the Tuileries. And then you have a little angle uh, uh, with the Louvre. And uh, many architects worked on the idea that they had to hide uh, this uh, dissymmetry or, or this anomaly. And so many architects wanted to build a transversal wing in order to hide the difference or to put a great circular building in the center so that you cannot really uh, 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 remark the difference. Uh, but finally today, and especially when the Tuileries existed, in fact, the difference was not really visible because of course, with the great palace of the Tuileries, the view was blocked. So you cannot really see the Louvre when you were, for example, on the Champs-Élysées and you cannot notice that there was something <laughs> which was wrong. And so today, exactly, we have to, to, to assume uh, this, this, uh, this anomaly. And when Pei uh, conceived the pyramid, of course, uh, it was a bit annoying because the pyramid uh, gives us a good repair, a good, uh, a good sign uh, in order to see that there is something wrong. And so he decided to put a copy of the statue of Louis XIV by Bernini at the, the real uh, geometric beginning of the main axis uh, in Paris. Mm -hmm. That's a great story. And, and everybody who can go to the Louvre, when, uh, and I'm sure we will be going soon, uh, you have to notice that uh, equestrian statue of Louis XIV, stand in front of it and look west. Uh, yeah. It's quite a surprise. We've had some re more recent questions that came up. So for example, what happens with the, uh, uh, what happened during the occupation, the German occupation? What happened to the collection of the Louvre? Yeah. How did it stay away from Goebbels? Yes, it was a very complex history. In fact, Goebbels uh, and, 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 uh, and Goering and so on, they did not really manage to, 
to to take some part of the collections uh, of the Louvre because uh, there was a government, you know, in France, the Vichy government, uh, which was collaborating with the Germans. So the German wanted to maintain this government, and they knew that it was not possible to to be too too hard against uh, with them. Uh, so the, the collections of the Louvre were preserved and they were preserved also because before, uh, just at the beginning of the war, many, many, uh, a great part of the collections um, was uh, uh, left Paris, left Paris in order to be uh, uh, hidden more or less uh, in, in different castles and especially in Chambord, um, in the Loire Valley. So first, the collections were uh, around Chambord, and then they moved uh, in the Massif Central, so in the center of France. So they were very well preserved during uh, the, the World War II. But uh, the Louvre is very deeply connected with uh, the events under Nazi uh, occupation because uh, the, the rooms that were empty were used by the administration of the, the Nazis in order to uh, gather all uh, the furniture, the collections and so on that were taken from the Jews. Mm -hmm. So there were some rooms uh, uh, in the Louvre uh, uh, which were devoted to that. In fact, the idea of the director of the National Museum at that time was that it would be easier uh, for uh, his administration to control more or less the German if uh, they put all the works of art uh, in the Louvre or also in a little museum in the uh, Jardin des in the Tuileries Garden, uh, which is called the Jeu de Paume. And you know that there was this very famous uh, film with, uh, uh, I think, Kate Blanchett a few years about a woman uh, who was very important because she worked in the rooms uh, where the Germans were uh, 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 gathering all the, the the, 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 the objects taken from the Jews. And so this woman was, uh, um, the name of this woman was Rose Vallon. And uh, at the end of the war, she worked uh, a lot in order to uh, find when it was possible, uh, the original owners. Uh, and so more or less during the war, she was like a spy. And so she was trying to make some list of uh, what was entering, what was going out, and where the objects were coming from uh, in parallel with uh, German administration. She was looking in the dust bins in order to find some papers and so on. And uh, so she was very important uh, at the end of the war uh, to find, to try to find the owners. But you know that this, uh, this uh, work to, to find the owners is still, is a still active process. Uh, because even today, there are some objects uh, that uh, are under the control of the national museums in France. But uh, these objects are not part of the national collections because they were found in Germany at the end of World War II. We know that they were in France, but we don't know yet uh, who are the owners. It is very difficult because many, many families, of course, disappeared entirely during a uh, second world war. And so for some objects, maybe we will never find the owners or the heirs of the owners again. I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, leave it there, Guillaume. Thank you once again for uh, your wonderful presentation. And I have to particularly thank you for moving it up one week on such short notice. Uh, you did a great job. Uh, and I think you've, you've all, you've convinced us exactly why the Louvre, uh, the history of France is embedded in the Louvre, as you have shown us. And we will be looking forward to receiving a recording of your lecture in the next day or two. Um, I would, uh, to close, like to thank the co-hosts of the series, the Alliance Française Miami Metro, Alliance Française de Chicago, and our partners, the Federation of Alliance Française USA, the French Heritage Society, thank you, Jennifer, uh, and Weiss in Paris. And thank you all for attending today's lecture. We have one left next Thursday, uh, which we, we hopefully will have the tour of the Chateau de Versailles with its senior heritage curator, Bertrand Rondeau. 
It will be the last in our series of lectures on the Grand Chateau, Chateau uh, so I hope you will join us. But first, would you please unmute yourselves and join me in giving a great round of applause to Guillaume Falconet. Hello. 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 Hello.